Hi, I'm Isman and welcome to this video lecture on working with raster data in ArcGIS. In this video I will focus on operators. There are other things, are ways of operating with them such as functions that we will be covering in another video. But here we will focus on using operators and some of the basic principles of working with raster data in ArcGIS. First of all, there are two different approaches to using uh, or manipulating raster data from raster data. There's the traditional, if you might say traditional, but there's a the ArcGIS's toolbox approach where there's a toolbox for each thing you want to do, like there was a overlay intersection tool in the vector world. Then there is tool for doing all the raster operations. And then there is a map algebra raster calculator, which is basically a command prompt where you can type, just like you would do on a normal calculator, you can type in your operations. That has the advantage that you can do everything in one tool very on very short space don't have takes doesn't take long time to combine the tools but sometimes it might be a bit more difficult to um, to understand the model afterwards because basically you could do the whole model in one tool namely this map algebra so um, it is a bit of a balance between when to use the map algebra and when to use the traditional tools but it's something that one finds one's own liking, what does one like to do and what feels right. Um, so both are there and it's up to you to decide when you want to use a tool for adding two raster layers together or you want to go into the map algebra field calculate, sorry, a raster calculator and say layer one plus layer two. That's basically where the difference is. All the tools um, are available from that toolbox that is called Spatial Analyst Tools. And there's one little speciality you should note that um, all the tools, they are say, made to take two raster layers together and do something with them, two or more. But you can always substitute one of these I think always, but at least most of the time, you can substitute a layer with a number. If you, instead of having, so you say raster layer one plus raster layer two, if you replace raster layer two with a number such as four, what it will do is that it will create, or pretend that there is a raster layer with a value four, which is exactly the same size and cell size as raster layer one and then add that four into each of the cells as if it was adding two raster layers together. So for most of them, if not all of the tools, you can substitute a raster layer with a number, being a float or an integer. Remember there is a important difference between integers or floating or real numbers if you wish um, in um, when we work with raster data. So, um, just to show you in ArcMap, let's clear this video thing here. So in ArcMap we have our tools we use for working with them down under my system tools. And then we have this spatial analyst toolbox. And here we have all the different tools and Map algebra is here in the middle, and this is where we can type map algebra. So, map algebra was uh, designed by Tomlin back in 18, 1983, so some years ago, and basically it was defined before GIS became a multi dollar industry. So, the concept was there before all of these different some commercial uh, software is available. So you'll find the same concept in almost all of 
the GISs that can work for raster data, such as ArcMap, H3C, GeoMedia, uh, Grass, which is the open source version of, of ArcMap if you visit. So the grand old man in raster data GIS sets uh, or geospatial applications, spatially enabled applications. So Grass is um, is the largest and biggest and still going very strong uh, open source um, software for this. And you can install Grass together with QGIS and then will give QGIS um, quite a lot of raster abilities. But otherwise, um, all of it is formally uh, implemented in ArcMap or ArcGIS. So um, there we can find all of the different things. And as I said, there are two approaches. We can look at operators. So basically, what is between the operands? So two plus four, then the operator is the plus, and the two and the four are the operands. And then there are functions that can do your sinus, as you probably know. So there are different different um, functions, and we'll cover the functions in another video. The operators that we normally use are the plus, the division, they are standard multiplication. Um, then there are these bit more special ones. There's the integer division and the modul modulus, um, which gives you uh, the integer part or the real part of your division. Um, used for odds and ends. There's the power and there's the subtraction, the minus. So. Uh, all of these are also available as tools. So there's a plus tool, no, almost all of them. There's a plus tool, a divide tool, a mod tool, a times tool, a power tool, and a minus tool. So if we were in ArcMap and we let's have some data uh, loaded, load some data from our catalog, and we will load the two different elevation data. Um, of Copenhagen area. So um, my raster demo folder down here and here we have the DTM so train model and the DSM that is the surface model. So we have these two layers and we can then do different things with these layers. Since we know that the DSM was the surface and we know that the DTM was trained. So how, how large are buildings? If we want to know that, we will subtract the DTM from the DSM. And um, this can then be done by using our tools. We should be good and uh, do this right. So we will just create a toolbox in our raster demo. And in our toolbox, we will create a little model. So now we have a model to do our things. And um, let's start with uh, doing it using a map algebra. So I load this one in and I'll load my to layers in. Normally when using tools we can draw a line and say this is input. You can't do that to map algebra. Map algebra will create that itself when you have filled in the command line or as you call it. So if I double click the master calculator I now can go in and say that I have my DSM minus my DTM. There are two versions of them. The yellow ones, they are the ones out here, and the blue ones, they are the ones that are loaded in the model. And uh, yeah, I've put it in my default database. Uh, I normally don't like that, so might as well uh, use my raster demo. And in my raster demo, call my um, layer buildings TIFF. So now I'm storing it 
in my uh, folder instead. Oh, I thought I had to type the minus there. So, hopefully it's bad now. So I can now say OK and run my model. And you can now see that it has drawn those lines by itself. So it was in picking up these data sets and running them. So I couldn't draw them manually. Uh, they will be drawn when I fill in the command in the raster calculator. I can now run my model and wait for a moment. So now my model has finished running. I can um, go and I can take my result data and I can then add it to my display. And I now have this new layer that contains my building heights. Um, which is very interesting um, because I have um, something that is lower than the original data sets, which is, uh, oh well, surprises come along. Um, but, so my train model and now my only my building data set. So I can brighten it up a bit so we can see what's going on. And I'll just assign some nice fancy colors and uh, do that inside my display. So we can zoom in on the old part of Copenhagen and look at some of those uh, known buildings and how high they are. So we have up here, we have Runetorn. So we can go in and look at Runetorn. We have it here and we can use our eye tool and ask how tall is the top of Runetorn and it is 43.1 meters and out here on the edge it's 36 meters. Um, and if you compare that to what we can look up, at, where do we have it here? Um, Aronetorn is officially um, 41.5 meters and the round can viewing platform is at um, 44.8 meters according to this. Um, so the question is who's right here? Um, and what we are working with. But we are very close to the same numbers at least. So I have the viewing platform at 36 meters and the top platform at 42.8 meters. So that is because we here had taken our DSM, our surface model, and subtracted the DTM. The difference is probably because what is the DTM um, inside a building? That's some artificial value. So there might be some uh, small, minute variations from there. If I look at what is the value just outside of Ronatone, you can see that we here have different values here. This should be more or less zero because there's no buildings here. Um, but it's not quite zero. Um, and we can also see there's some artifacts from um, the scanner not being completely uh, horizontal. So we have a side look at the building here. But apart from those small details, if we subtract the DSM, well, uh, subtract the DTM from the DSM, we can look at the tree heights or building heights. So the tree outside Hornetorton is about 10 meters at the highest point. Um, so that's the type of information we can easily get using those standard operators. So these were those plus minus, divide, subtract, power so on. And they work just like on any other calculator. Then there are a set of operators that are logical ones. Just like we have in SQL in Vector World, we have a Boolean AND, 
and they are called boolean because there is also other ands when we talk about there's a bitwise and that we seldom use but it's there so therefore we emphasize that the boolean and is the and that is like the one we have in SQL so we have a boolean and a complement of it is the not we have a or an exclusive or and then we have a equal to note that we here use the double equal this is the comparison equal okay. we have basically we have two when in programming there's two types of equals there is the assignment equal say a equal b means typically take the contents of b and put into a while a double equal b means is a equal b so this is the comparison equal there is a greater than there is a greater than equal to and so on all of these standard operators that we have are here so we can use them so we can now create logical expressions remember from my first video on raster that basically zero is false and anything else is true so seven is true five is true so we have to be very explicit when using our comparison operators here and use some extra brackets to ensure that we know what we're doing so if we wanted to find all the places in Copenhagen where the terrain more is between let's say half a meter and two meters above sea level so those are those that are in let's say immediate danger of being um, submerged even if you have a sea level rise we can um, do this by going back to our model and I'll get rid of this model here way and I'll create a new one where I just look at the DTM and we then use a I was interested in if they are greater than so down under math there is a logical and here we have all these logical operators so if it is greater than I can draw that one in that's input master so if this one is greater than 0.5 and uh, I just put it default hmm okay mine is running on a comma so 0.5 this layer will now contain all those places that are larger than uh, 0.5 now the model is finished I can see what I've got just need to display it so basically everything is higher than 0 0.5 um, go to my table of contents and zoom to here so of course the C area which is less than um, obviously zero so what I now want to know is which of these areas are lower than two meters so if I now say instead of greater than go and um, find my less than two I could put this one in say that it has to be less than and uh, two meters and what I'm interested in is now the areas that are true in this one and also true in this one so that would be a boolean and so this 
will now give me, once it's finished, this would give me all the areas that are more than a half a meter, that's basically land areas, and all of those that are lower than two meters, so all the low-lying areas, and then I say that they have to be true in both of them, so the and, so that would be all the land areas that are higher than half a meter and also lower than two meters. These are my flood risk areas, if you wish. So I'll add this to display and run the model. So now that my model has finished, let's see if we are ready to have some results. Our map sometimes does this, this disappears. No thing to worry about. Um, so we have our data set here and we have some different layers. Now, we have our table of contents, we have our greater than, our boolean, and we can also have, if you want to have this one added to our display. So we have our three components. Um, we have our layer of airs that are greater than over half a meter. That's these airs. We have the green area here. We have areas that are less than two meters. So that's all of these areas and what was interesting was then those areas that were both true in this layer and in that layer so these are the ones that we have in our AND layer here so this is all the areas in this pink color that are higher than half a meter above sea level but lower than two meters above sea level so these are the ones that we'll be looking at adapting to climate change that we might be a bit cautious about. Of course this was a wee bit uh, relatively long model to do something relatively simple and uh, what we could do is that we could uh, delete all of this and this is one of these situations where I probably would use uh, map algebra so if we wanted to do the same model using map algebra or raster calculator, we're starting by just simply dragging in our model and then dragging in our raster calculator. Going into the raster calculator and then typing in our expression, which was this one should be uh, larger than, and this is one of those annoying things. My note that I made a mistake before when I did the model build the greater than and larger than they wanted to have a comma 0.5 model builder is a bit more conservative they want to have the dot 0.5 um, and that's just one of those annoying things that ArcMap tries to adopt to Danish nomenclature but not everywhere because some this is probably something of the oldest uh, code in uh, ArcMap and that hasn't apparently been able to adopt to uh, um, the national language of uh, decimal values so we'll have to live with that type of annoying things and note that this when so this is the first part of it and it's a good idea to put in a bracket around it that and then we want to say and there's no and here and that's because it uses these other numbers so the and is the ampersand see if you remember from the slide that the and is the ampersand and the pipe is the or so we use the ampersand and we'll put in an R bracket the brackets are important because of this thing about that values in raster can be interpreted as true and false so it's important to say that it should not try and say a half which is true and 
this one is that larger than C in 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 less than true or so it can make a bit of a difficulty for it to decide what this means so therefore put in brackets whenever you do raster calculations with ands and ors so this is um, the calculation of it which um, then compares to what we did before this is exactly the same as the previous model um, you can see when I hold mouse over it, it will give you the value. It might be a um, good idea to uh, create a label here. So this label here, if I can get hold of it, here, it linked to my tool here. So here I can go in and type that uh, 0.5 is d t m o less than two. So now I have a label describing um, my uh, model, and even though I updated and also arrange it, the label follows my operator here. So I can add documentation to my tools by adding labels. So all of this is right and ready to run, and I'll play press run and. Um, be back when the model is finished. Now that the model is finished running, we can see that we have got shadows under all our tools. We can um, go up and look at our results. So if we look here at our table of contents, we have our new raster calculator here, where we, where we have done it using the raster calculator and if I compare that one to what we see here should be the same as what we see here let's get rid of some of this and I'll just change this color so it's red so we can easier see that there are two different layers so this was the result of finding the errors using models and this is the result of the area using the map algebra and you can see that they look identical I can subtract them from each other and I'm quite convinced that I will have a layer of only zeros in it so I have now done what I did before using map algebra and it does become much easier to read and much more compact and it also runs a wee bit faster. So that was using logical operators less than ands and ors and the things to remember here is that we have the double equal for if is for asking if something is equal to something else and we have all those larger than and less than and then instead of having typing and and or we use the percent and the pipe and remember always always to use those special or uh, using brackets to ensure that you help it decide what you're doing because numbers can be interpreted as true and false so remember the brackets there are some uh, specialities in uh, in raster data that we have there's a concept of null the problem is that in vector data you have an object and where there's no object there's no data while obvious so that you can draw a forest and you know that inside that polygon there's a forest and outside there's nothing but in raster data there must there are small cells everywhere so we have to put some information into those small cells there's no areas that is not covered by a cell. So therefore, we have the possibility of putting no data in. So if we put a no data in, it means that this has not been measured or we don't know what's here, as compared to a zero, a false. There are different operators, especially when we look at distance, they operate on no data. 
So there are some situations where we have to be a bit explicit about what no data is. And no data really can't be, it, if there's something is no data, it can be difficult to do anything about it. There are two tools that can convert no data to something else or can set specific values to no data. There is the is null tool, which um, if we have this example down here, we say is null of our in raster, and that will return one where the data is zero, or where this data is no data, and zero for all the other ones. So remember, it's asking, is it no data? So you will get a one, true, all the places where it is no data, and a zero, all the places where it's not no data. So that can convert no data to numbers that we can work with. And then there is the set null that does more or less the opposite, and that it returns a no data where something is true. So in this case, we say set null where our in raster is larger than five. So here, if this is true, our in data is larger than five, we will return a null. Otherwise, we will in return whatever was in our in data. Okay. So it, this set null take its first parameter is the, the equation that it will evaluate. So is in data one larger than five? If it is, it will return a null. If it's not, it will return the whatever was in in data. So we will have a data set that consists of values from whatever up to five and anywhere where that in data was five or high or was higher than five, larger than five, it will return a null. So is null can be used to convert from null data to two and false data, one and zero data. Set null can be used to convert specific data values to the null. If you look in the toolboxes for these values, you could of course use the search and you just go and type set null and it will locate the tool for you and it locates down under spatial analyst conditions and here we have the set null the is null is down here where we were before in the logical operators here we have the is null so the set null is under conditional and the is null is under logical both of these in our spatial analyst tool okay finally we have some small things we have to consider um, one of the annoying things is that if you do operators on integer values so you have two integer values two raster layers of integer values or a raster layer and an integer then the output will always be an integer so if you have a raster layer with a value of five and another raster layer with a value of two and say the layer with the fives divided by the layer with the twos you'll get a three or maybe a two you don't really i don't can't remember which because it will return the integer and I can't remember if it does a rounding up or always just returns the integer part. So that's a problem. That's really annoying and many people have mistakes there. You can avoid it by forcing one of the layers to be a float or if it was a number that you were writing. So you would say the raster layer with the fives in it divided by a, a value of 2.0. Then it's not 2, the integer value 2, but it's a floating value 2. And then it will work and you'll get a raster layer with a floating value of 2.5. Or you can use the float operator. So you can say that raster layer with the, with the fives in it divided by float of the raster layer. So this function here the float function so you can say this is the five divided by the float of the twos 
and that will also give you a new layer with, with a value of two and a half. Um, many of the tools have an annoying thing that you can see in this dialog box here, the query builder tool, is that if there's not an attribute table, and remember that we show that on some data that is um, soda colored or integer value rasters, they don't necessarily have an attribute table. You can create it, but if it's not there, many of the tools will not be able to auto fill out as you normally have. You can click on the attributes and that will type it in. So the one that because there's no attribute table there, these don't really understand what's going on. And you'll then have to manually type the value and the value is called value. So the attribute of a raster is called value. And if the tool that you're using to see this can't see the attribute, then you'll have to type the word value yourself. So over in this query builder, you'll have to type the value less than 10 because this layer did not have an attribute table and therefore the tool couldn't pick up the value and therefore we'll have to type it in manually. So that's another little annoying thing you have to be aware of. And then finally, what I've mentioned earlier, that because numbers can be evaluated as true and false, it's important to use brackets. So whenever you're using ands and ors, ensure that you have brackets so your, your expression can be interpreted correctly. So that was this introduction to working with raster data. I've talked about the operators. I've talked about some of those special things about no data or null and how to convert them using the set null and the is null and emphasize that whenever you use ands and ors, you'll have to use brackets in your uh, sentences so that they can be evaluated correctly. So I hope you liked it. See you. Bye.